at 30, and uh, we'll officially call the Community Mental Health of Ottawa County Board of Directors meeting uh, to order. Uh, first, want to uh, be able to uh, have everybody uh, meet uh, Dorothy Hendricks, she's our uh, newest board member. Dorothy, <laughs> thank you for. Uh, and uh, appreciate you being here. Thank you. Is there someone that would be willing to do uh, an invocation for us? I would. Do. Would you? Oh, very good. Thank you, Bonnie. You're welcome, Matt. <laughs> Father in heaven, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you for this time of year. And we just want to be and we look forward to celebrating Christmas and we just ask you to bless this meeting and um, bless all the staff that are involved in the work here and uh, as we go forward with this meeting. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just, uh, please uh, be aware and uh, incorporate our, our mission and vision. <coughs> <coughs> Have public comment. This will be our first opportunity for public comment. We'll get to you in a minute. <laughs> anybody online no. wishes to speak? I don't have anybody asking to speak. No. It'll be a second opportunity for public comment towards the end of our meeting. So if we don't have any right now. We'll move right on to our consent items and the suggested motion is to approve the agenda for November the 28th. Okay. Supported. And we're gonna move those minutes in there too. <laughs> we'll that, that yes. for those <laughs> support down at the other end. Yes. Okay. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of approving our consent resolutions indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. Next is uh, village update. We have Anna in there, but I think Barbara from uh, the Momentum Center is going to uh, uh, talk to us. I don't want to do that. And I understand there's no clicker. Just... Do you want the presentation first or the? Yes. Okay. Yeah, let me give me some time to share my screen here. Forward. Yeah. You can sit down or stand up, whichever is your choice. Hmm. <laughs> have a seat. Have a seat? Okay. I will sit. Uh, so I am Barbara Lee Van Horsen. I am the experimenter at the Momentum Center, and I see a lot of familiar faces. Um, you can go ahead and click to the next slide. I think everybody here is familiar with how the Momentum Center came to be, which was through uh, really a, a community conversation. So we started by talking to the community about what the problems, what the gaps were in services. Um, heard mental illness come up over and over again, convened the mental illness task force, uh, which included people from the public and started envisioning what the Momentum Center would be. And, uh, and then we're fortunate enough to be able to write the RFP and get funding to be able to open. Um, if you want to go ahead and go forward, a couple of the things, some of the things that really make it a, an innovative program, uh, and again, this was taken from community input, uh, one is the populations that we serve. Uh, so the Momentum Center serves people with mental illness, addictions, and disabilities, populations that often are segregated and treated separately. Uh, we bring all of that together. And then we operate the Momentum Cafe, which is open to the public. And that's a really important piece because it creates social integration instead of unintentionally creating more isolation for our members. Um, we've actually come to find that about 30% of our members had a soft entry through the cafe initially. Hmm. Um, we also provide in this space a venue for community conversations. So when, when we started as a nonprofit, our focus was on social justice and, and human rights. We've continued those conversations. 
and it gives our members a place to engage in larger community conversations. We don't shy away from controversial topics. Um, we've talked about gun control and marijuana legislation, for instance. Um, and so it's an important piece of our work. And then it's a brick and mortar place for people to find resources. Um, we invite other nonprofits to bring their materials in so people can come in and get the information. People who don't necessarily feel comfortable navigating the web, don't necessarily want to call 211, um, they can come in. We put the materials specifically by the doors so you can grab and go. If you don't want to talk to anybody, you don't have to talk to anybody. Uh, we also have done qualitative research to figure out why what we're doing works. And I'll talk about our, our evidence of it working. Um, but the key techniques that uh, came up when uh, we had Grand Valley students do qualitative research was one is management by strengths, which is similar to a Meyer Briggs or a DISC profile. It's what I wear on my badge. Um, we use that with all of our staff, our volunteers, our board. Uh, and it's really helped us create an empathy first environment how do other people, you're treating people the way they want to be treated and not the way we want to be treated. Uh, we do charge a $1 a year membership fee. Uh, we do that because we believe $1 is accessible for most people. Although we do offer scholarships if, uh, if that is a barrier and it has been, um, but it serves an important symbolic role in meeting an affiliation need. Of uh, paying that dollar makes you a member, it takes you from being an outsider to an insider. And, and we found that that's been really important. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to aesthetics, um, that our surroundings are not uh, sterile or institutional. Uh, Destigmatization and safety is key, normalizing the conversation and accepting people exactly where they are. And then personal agency. Uh, we are program driven, so it's not a drop in center. You can't just come and sit on the couch all day. It's, it's very much programmed, but you have you always have the option of what you'll participate in and what you won't. So in, it's not a prescribed program. Uh, so personal autonomy um, is, is key throughout. People always can decide what they want to participate in and what they want to refrain from. Um, so all of those things are cheap, they're unique, they're powerful, um, which means they're innovative. Uh, some of the activities that we, we do, we really fill the gap in the continuum of care between the individual and clinical care. So we're providing, um, we're meeting the behavioral health script, exercise, meditation, yoga, nutrition, um, baking and cooking and grocery shopping, financial literacy, uh, bingo, arts and crafts, <laughs> just positive community space. Uh, you name it, we do it. The next slide talks a little bit about our uh, external, uh, our outings. We have a bus that'll hold two wheelchairs and another van. Uh, at least once a week, we're going someplace <coughs> locally, um, whether that's grocery shopping, a movie, miniature golf, something. And uh, at least once a month, we're going further away. I know we're going to Meyer Gardens, I think this week. Uh, we go <coughs> to, a, to sporting events, the zoo, the orchard. And all of that's included in that $1 membership fee. Uh, I want to show you our sizzle reel. Okay, give me a minute to find it. Oh, it's playing. Oh. Oops. Thought I had it. Okay. Can you turn up? I can. Oh. I walked to the door, didn't know anybody, uh, and um, so I was open.
So uh, the important thing is the impact we're having. I think if you just head forward. It'll... Yeah, it's just like I didn't even have to go the other one. <laughs> uh, there, there we, we go. go. <laughs> so what difference does it make? Um, so we are normalizing the conversation, uh, creating an empathy first community. Oh, sorry, I lost it. That's okay. We're giving people purpose and, and, going forward. <laughs> and meaning and hope. Uh, and, and we're literally saving lives. Um, so that's it. Go ahead. <laughs> I'm trying to get rid of all my other extraneous things. Um, and, and so we have lots of stories. We have a lot of, and I'm speeding up because I know we have a limited time, um, <laughs> but we have lots of anecdotal stories. But we're more than that. We're also very data-driven. We do ongoing data collection at the program level. Uh, we also have research-directed data collection, and then we utilize that data for program evaluation and development. Uh, so this shows you um, some of our, our initial research, uh, which indicated that people were experiencing statistically significant improvements in depression, anxiety, loneliness, and social connectedness um, at six months and at one year. And then I wanted to show you a little bit about our membership. Trials. So uh, we actually started in April 2017, which is by March 7th, 2017, we had zero members. Um, we're, up, we're just over 200 members now. You can't see it on the slide because of hope the owl. Um, but you'll see a dip there at March. We, we were holding steady and then COVID happened. And so we lost some membership during that time. We stayed connected virtually but it was a really difficult time for people. Uh, and that has, has since returned. And just to give you an idea of, of membership types, um, that gray line at the bottom are members who have both a mental illness and a developmental disability. Uh, so that's held pretty steady at about 20 people. Um, right now that'd be um, about 20% of the population. Uh, then we have the developmentally disabled and then the mental illness on top of that. So uh, with 200 members, you can, you can do the math. <laughs> Go ahead to the next one. Uh, and then this is about membership engagement. So we track uh, how active people are. We never do signups. We don't sit on the corner and say, it's only a buck, you should come be a member. Uh, we're not interested in having 700 members that aren't engaged. We really want people to be engaged at the center. So they have to come in and fill out their application. Uh, and then we track their participation. So the gray bars are the people, we, we call them active members. They're participating in specific programs that we offer for members. The orange bars are people who are, are haven't engaged in those activities, but are still engaged. So they might be coming into the cafe, hanging out at the cafe. They might be coming to the movie night. They might be participating in those community conversations. So they're still engaged with the program, but they're not um, signing up for yoga or taking the, or participating in bingo, right? Those very specific programs. And again, that gets to that autonomy, what I'll participate in, what I set out. And then the blue line are the inactives. Those are the people who aren't participating uh, in any way. Um, 
which is a pretty, pretty a pretty small percentage. Yeah. And then if you go to the next slide, this is where we're reaching out to those people to try to figure out what's happening. So if we haven't seen somebody in 30 days, we're, we're checking in. Um, sometimes they're back at work. Sometimes they're in jail. Sometimes they're in a hospital. Um, very seldom do we not know where somebody is. So you'll see our contact rate is, is very high. Um, I don't think it's ever dipped below like 94% of being able to know where people are and what's happening. Um, you can skip these. I don't think we have time. So there's like six slides of case study here. If I have, you can invite me back and I'll talk about the case studies. <laughs> One more. There we go. Um, I know that there's been questions about what we're receiving from the millage and then how that uh, goes into the budget. So uh, here I put together a pie chart for our income. We get uh, $290,000 a year um, roughly from, from the millage. Uh, our budget this fiscal year is about $670,000. So that's 43% of the budget. And when we opened, 100% of our budget was the millage. That was it. <laughs> so we've worked really hard to, to develop our place in the community and to find um, support and partners. Um, that millage money is still critical. It's still 43% um, of our budget. Um, but we also have corporate donors, individual donors, uh, income that's generated through other activities and then grants. And then on the expense side, 74% of our expenses are going to the Grand Haven site, which includes our administrative expenses and overhead. Um, about 12% to Holland, where we opened about a year ago uh, in the Boys and Girls Club and then moved to our own facility, um, the former Community Action House in April. And then we were able to bring somebody full time on in July. Uh, and we have a uh, part-time, um, Christian Garcia is part-time and speaks Spanish. We brought him on intentionally to be able to reach out to the migrant population. Um, so, uh, and then 2% it showed goes into our prom expenses. Um, prom is our, our major fundraiser, but it's also an important part of our member program uh, because we bring people together again and socially integrate uh, folks that don't normally spend a lot of time together. Uh, people who will spend $1,000 on a silent auction item and people that could never have dreamt of saving up $25 to buy their own ticket to the prom. So I invite you all to come to the prom. It's an amazing <coughs> evening of dinner and dance and fun. And I, you will never have more fun than going to the prom. <coughs> uh, so we've also been able to use those millage of dollars to leverage other money. Um, we've gotten a grant from the, we, we used it to get a grant from the Community Foundation of Holland Zealand, which helped us to start the Momentum Center. I have another grant pending, application pending with them now, so cross your fingers, because we have to do more there. Uh, we were able to get a grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan Foundation, which is allowing us to partner with MSU to test an intervention on emotional regulation uh, with people with mental illness. Uh, it was developed uh, specifically and proven to work well with people on the autism spectrum. And now we have an opportunity to, to test this uh, intervention in another population. So we're really excited about that. And then we also were able to leverage money to uh, get money from our community foundation in Grand Haven for research to explore the connection between engagement with the Momentum Center and mental mm -hmm. health outcomes. Forward it. Uh, so that research included Ben Atlas, that's our Travis Andrews, uh, he's the owner, he's the PhD data scientist who showed up at our door one day and said, do you have any data? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think he was expecting to get as much data. <laughs> he's been great. MSU, uh, North Ottawa Community Health Care Pine, which is now, of course, Trinity Health, so we'll see how that continues to play out, uh, Pine Rest and CMH. Uh, this was a graph that Travis has put together, uh, but the short explanation of this is that people who are engaged regularly at the Momentum Center require fewer CMH services while keeping their uh, ANSA score um, level or improving. So we're finding that for every dollar we receive from the millage, we're creating $4 in value in the community, which is no small amount. 
And there's other uh, qualitative benefits, uh, providing that physical activity for members. I shouldn't put these all as individual bullet points. Um, a place for, for, uh, for social space and connections, friendships and relationships forming that go beyond the walls of, of the Momentum Center. Uh, growth and transformation, we have a, a lot of members who have become involved um, in other places in the community. People who are employed now, who are not employed before, uh, family members talking about how much more engaged uh, their loved ones are in the, the community. We've been able to alleviate caregiver burden, especially among um, our, our people who graduate from the, the uh, school programs at 26 and then have nothing afterward. Um, it's, it's, we've been able to provide a, a great relief for folks there. Um, our members, again, being engaged in the community itself in a variety of ways. And then the community becoming more aware of mental illness and developmental disabilities and addictions, um, that, that two-way street of awareness. Uh, and finally, uh, opportunities to engage in issues. And as I said, one of the things that, that Travis has found with the research is the importance to our members of being able to engage in those conversations about issues that are bigger than themselves, right? We all need to know there's something bigger than our own needs. Um, and that's been an important piece of our program. Uh, in terms of indicators for improvement, what are we working on? Um, we have identified the need for affiliate groups. We've started those, we'll be starting others. What that basically means is um, everybody's welcome at the center which uh, if you walk in, you might think, well, this isn't my tribe. Um, I have two sons, one is schizophrenia. He grills our hot dogs and hamburgers and he's a very active member. I have another son who has depression and anxiety. And when he walks in, he sees um, physical disabilities and developmental and intellectual disabilities and thinks this isn't, this isn't my place. Uh, and so we've started these affiliate groups to meet specific identity and interest needs. So we have an LGBT group. We have a working moms and kids group. Um, we've been working on a mental health and movies group, um, just finding different ways to engage people besides everybody coming to the center. Um, increasing the cafe as a soft entry to our services. We just uh, received notice that we're getting a grant from the Mental Health Endowment Fund, Michigan Health Endowment Fund, um, that'll help us um, and uh, for capacity building to really determine the best way to bring people into that site to increase that flow um, and then increase the presence of our members in the community. So that is so, so we're more and more visible. Do the members um, work in the ca cafe? So, so we have members who volunteer at the cafe. And if I had, I would absolutely hire them if I have an opening. We're cautious about, we don't do job training because job training is a Medicaid reimbursable program and receiving the, the uh, funding from the millage, we don't wanna create any appearance that we're using the millage for Medicaid reimbursable mm -hmm. services mm -hmm. because that would jeopardize. Yeah. So we've been, that was, I came, um, one of my former positions was a job developer and I assumed that's one of the things we would do. And then we realized that there could be some trickiness to that. So um, we do have a number of members who are working out at Kenzie's Bee Cafe, and they did all their interview um, interviews at the Momentum Center. So that's been a, a really neat partnership. Oh, I thought there was, sure there was one more, and now I have to think of what it was. <laughs> no, what, what um, is next? Well, okay. okay. And questions. I'm happy to answer any other questions. Is there, is there a way to keep coming to the Well, so what we do is volunteer. So we do two volunteer training. Um, and then we aren't at a place right now where we're like, we have some one dollar coffee, so it's not a. Uh, we're not making money at the cafe, which is okay because it's part of our program. So uh, um, making a profit isn't mm -hmm. our priority. 
Um, right now we're doing a feasibility study. We're hoping that we are able to raise money to move into another site, which would allow us to expand our food offerings and open up the potential for hiring um, members in that space. So the food volunteer opportunity is that still an avenue that you can assist with some job training? Yeah, yep. Yep. Help somebody develop. Yeah, and we've done that, and I think that's why um, it was easy for some of our members to get hired at Kenzie's because we were doing serve safe training and just training for, for them as volunteers. Another question: Are you mm -hmm. seeing are you seeing your inactive but engaged numbers starting to change? I'm assuming it looked like there was a rough shift. They're coming back at, up at the start of COVID. Yeah, and you're starting to see that. Yeah, it was before COVID. correct, it was correct. It's rebounding. Um, we mm -hmm. had a, a COVID was really hard. Um, you know, when your whole purpose for being is to bring people into community and then you have to close the doors and tell them to go home. Um, huge gut punch. We did uh, right away uh, um, start a sign, we signed phone buddies, we pivoted virtual, we started um, bringing care kits to people's homes. We did everything we could think of to make sure people knew they were still part of the community, even when we couldn't be together. And then as soon as we could, we started gathering at parks, outdoors, and we, we were as proactive as we could possibly be. But it's still, um, it was still a challenge. And, uh, and there's, there are members and volunteers that have not come back since COVID. And, and we don't know, especially around the volunteers, if they ever will. Um, we did have a vac uh, vaccination mandate for our members um, and for our staff and our volunteers. Uh, we felt that that was an important piece of, of providing safety. We did just lift the vaccination requirement um, last month, given the, the changes throughout the, the country. So that will no longer be a limit. Did the membership have a service plan of some sort? It's social and recreational. Okay. So, so they're able to come in exactly where they are and participate in what they want. And okay. it's, it's very member driven. We do have a, a monthly member meetings where the members give us feedback on the kind of activities and programs they'd like to see us offer. Um, and we, we send out a monthly uh, a newsletter. We mail out to everybody making sure we Events. Still supported from the community as an organization. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we are. I think um, we still need to be better known. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and there's always that, that, and, and I'm sure it never fails to amaze me the number of people that go, I didn't even know you were here. And people are always really thrilled to find out we're here. Uh, so we need whatever help any of you can provide in making sure that we're getting that word out. Yeah. Um, that capacity building grant from the Michigan Health uh, Endowment Fund um, will help. We have some monies assigned in there for some marketing and promotion. So hopefully that'll help help us get to the next level as well. We found, it, I mean, it, it's a model that works. It's making a difference. Um, we'd love to replicate it all over the place. Is the house site uh, similar to the Grand Avenue site? It is. It's uh, it's very similar. It's not, the programming isn't quite as robust yet because we don't have the staff for it to be as robust. So that's where I'm hoping to get the community foundation dollars. And, and uh, we just added another person to our board from Holland. So we're really working to grow and develop those relationships and identify, um, again, those other funding sources so we can do more. Uh, the other piece that we don't have in place yet, but we're in the process is that um, social integration piece. So we are working with the health department and we have kind of initial approval to serve hard pack ice cream. We've ordered the equipment and, and the plan is to be able to, again, affordable, a dollar for a scoop, two dollars for two scoops kind of uh, ice cream um, operation. And we have somebody who in the spring will start bringing a food truck at least once a week um, with pizza. So that's a nice combination. Um, and, and so that's, that might have been if there was one more slide, the, the Holland pieces. 
uh, getting that more fully operational. We were also able this summer to participate with the health department in the, uh, the program using our bus to pick up um, migrant workers from the camps and bring them into town for groceries, laundry, uh, a meal, worship if they wanted to, and then back. That was, that was a wonderful program to be able to participate in as well. Nice presentation, thank you. Mm -hmm. thank you. Great. Thanks. How many staff? Six full-time, two part-time. Okay. All underpaid. <laughs> Thank you. Thank very you, much. Thank you. Yes. All right. Okay. Our utilization uh, dashboard report, Rich. That was a hard presentation. Oh, yeah. Very, very good. Um, I have some UM uh, reports, a uh, dashboard report to present to you guys. It's attached to A. And there are five uh, data points that I'd like to go over real quickly. Um, things that UM keep track of. Um, I think I come with a report to you guys every six months. And sometimes it's different data. So uh, for today, we're going to cover consumer served Medicaid penetration rate. We're going to look at a subset of ANSA. Um, hospital readmission, and then monthly high utilizers at the ED department. So the first report, you were looking at basically just annual data um, that was ran from October 21 to September. Um, you'll notice that in terms of consumer service, we're hovering right around an average of about 200 or just below that. Uh, 2,000, sorry, not 200. Um, one thing to note is that that's not. August 32 to September, there's a little bit of a dip. Um, that's because not all of the data has been ran yet. There's some lag in the data and the claims. So um, our anticipation is that will that will climb up to closer to 2,000, not 200. Um, the next report, the Medicaid penetration rate, it has made pretty level since uh, June, February of uh, 20, and we're, we're right around the 4% mark there. I have recently requested a, um, a penetration rate for the LRE because we usually we put it on here, but um, they haven't published one in, in, a, in a while. So I requested it today to see how we stack up. Mm -hmm. uh, in the past, we're usually right, right around, they're usually right around four and a half, five percent So we're not too far off, but um, I will be requesting that from the QI world. Um, to have that data published again. So in terms of the answer, what we're looking at here on the left-hand side is the number of counts uh, of individuals that were assessed. So this was for um, the year. Um, and what we're looking at is FY22 data. Um, these are individuals that have received two assessment scores, at, at least two assessment scores uh, for the answer. And what we're looking at, particularly in terms of uh, these uh, the, the bar graphs here, are the questions on strengths. Because uh, one of the things I was asking UM is, let's let's look at the strengths that um, uh, that are being asked of the answer. So one of them, uh, for example, is community connect connection, right? So when we're looking at this, how many people during that measurement period showed the decline in terms of their response to that assessment? Uh, so we're seeing here there was a decline in seven individuals, but there was also a 24% that showed improvement. So the blue line shows the number of individuals that improved, while the gray line shows the decline for each of these questions. So in terms of natural supports, you're looking at about a five or six um, that responded that, that their natural supports declined, but then you have about 17 to 18 that improved. So clinical staff that are in UM get an, a picture of how the, the MI adult population that are um, that are assessed using the answer gets a picture of how the population is improving or what areas need uh, attention. Rick, is that a number or percentage? It's a number of individuals. So that's the number of individuals. Yeah. 
So out of the FY22, there was a, a total of a sample of 358 for, the, for, this, for this period. Um, the next one is FY21 hospital readmission rate. So this is similar to the indicator 10 that we looked at in terms of the MIMBAs. So uh, follow-up after hospitalization, we don't want to see this go above 15% in the 30 days. But we also measure it at 60 day as well and 90 days. So our data is really good. We're, we're staying below that 15% um, readmission rate here on the left-hand side. And even at the 90 day marker, we're only, you know, we're, we're averaging between the five and 10%, right around 7%. Um, the last report here is the uh, high utilizers report. And what we're looking at here is we're looking at individuals that go to the ED and we're, we're, we're trying to see how many people um, on a uh, quarterly basis. This report is actually from the CT360 report that uh, MDH has published. So we look at this because um, any encounters at the ED is available to us. And so they, they provide this report. And so we can follow up if we need to. Hey, our numbers are going up, our numbers are going down. So what you'll see is uh, from 2020, uh, November of 2020, um, it's been pretty stable. We did have a spike somewhere around February, March in 2020 of COVID. So we're thinking, we don't know exactly why that spike is there, it's an outlier, but we're thinking that's, that's right before the time that COVID hit, so there might have been a lot of visits at the time. Um, What's the numbers on, as far as the number of people? The number of people is like, it's pretty much five. So if you're looking at 22, uh, seventh month, mm -hmm. you're right around five. So it's, mm -hmm. that's, that's the number. You could have people. one or two could throw it off. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not much. The, the range is not much. That outlier of 30, 31 people mm -hmm. uh, during just before COVID was pretty significant. So it's like we're asking questions for a while. So to be a high utilizer, you have to have, was it six visits in six months or is it 12? I think it's six. Six, six, and six months. So I'm going to get that three. actual measure. It's six and three, I think. Six and three? Six and three months. Six, Six in three months. I think that's what it is. I'm gonna I'm gonna get that and email that out. The exact measure. Any questions on these? Is there anything in this report that is anything concerning? Um. So I think I think our next in terms of UM. So this was the focus this year in terms of the answer was was the strengths. So these are really the strength questions. Mm -hmm. And um, I think some of the questions that have come up is the other part of the answer is the needs. Mm -hmm. So we will be looking at that as well. And I think there's gonna be some data in there that, that might require more attention. So um, I think nothing that's worth that stands out. I mean, everything is pretty much in line with, with our expectation. Yeah. That's something that I know you're looking at. Um, look at the state. Is this typical? Yeah, they do publish a state penetration. It was an old indicator that they used to have. I can't remember the indicator name, but it used to be something um, that the state tracked. Uh, the state tracked. Um, and that's the same indicator that the LRE has now. I think historically they're just trying to keep it up, even though it's no longer required. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's the number that I'm after. They do publish it. So I'll get that as well. Once I get that, I can send that out. Thank you. Any further questions, board members? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. No old business. And we got just a couple contracts. Since there's only two. <laughs> All right. Um, 
So the first is the Newton Court, the new contract. Um, they are located in Martin, um, 3101. And then the second is an amendment to our training needs for the rehabilitation services for uh, when they were placed in their effective size. That's a pretty, a pretty new program in the building, the Serenity Homes. It's it's all new, and so it's uh, it's nice to see giving them a shot in that neck of the woods. Any questions? In the service contracts. We'll need a motion for approval. So we need a motion and a second. No further questions. All those in favor of approval of the two service contracts and your attachment B, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that motion carries. And next is our financial report, which is attachment C. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Um, we're in a pretty good net position. You'll see uh, in the bottom right, total Medicaid funding exceeds our uh, budget and actuals, so we're in a good place. <coughs> um, within our mental health funds to the top left and our SAD funds, in the <coughs> bottom, we're still as of October 31st waiting on our first payments from grants. A lot of times at that first month, you know, there's a little lag in that, but um, expenses were not exceeded or did not exceed revenues, so that's good. We've kind of leveled down a little. A lot of our grants were just coming in, and we just received some more today. So, um, leveling that out, getting into a good uh, position, and not much more to report. I don't know if anybody has questions or comments. Um, Nick, our budget analyst, is also here. We're going to um, Going to talk a little bit about, uh, I guess that's what we need to make a, have a motion first. So, yep, I need a motion to uh, approve the 2023. So, moved and support. Move, motion, support, discussion. Seeing none, all those in favor of approval, attachment C. Indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, that motion carries. And then, uh, attachment B. All right, so Nick, our analyst, he's been working for some years. Getting some um, grant dollars and whatnot for millage and on two parts of the Sure. Um, the main change with the attachment C is our millage. Some of the mental health and SUV grants um, based on transport dollars that came from the first reported in July to what the final numbers were. And then um, this year, 23 was a good carryover. Um, and then we have a couple of grants going to mental health um, for our ACP team. That's going to be a great reimbursement for an incentive to um, for the increased overtime costs that we are now having for the incentive for our ACP team. And then we're also receiving an 
ARPA grant as a part of SUD and our block grant amount increase for the contract. Should be in pretty good shape. Mm -hmm. Questions, board members? I also need a, a motion for approval of uh, budget amendment. So moved. Support. Motion support. Any further questions? Seeing none, all those in favor of approval attachment D, budget amendment, indicate by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? That motion carries. <coughs> and then we have some appointments to the Larry to appoint Richard Canton to the Lakeshore Region Energy Board through the two year term, effective October 1st, which is gone. Gone. <laughs> gone. Uh, through September 30th of 2024. And Rich, you have agreed to. Uh, He's not here. What's he doing? Well, he isn't here. He's not here. He's not here. Well, I guess we can appoint him then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good. <laughs> he, he's uh, willing. I'm yes, assuming. he is. Yeah. Okay. No, All right. All right. Without him, but he's not on this board. No. no. So Richard was. Yes. Yes. He his, yeah. he was term limited, and um, I think it's been a year. Since he served on this board, he continues to serve on the LRE substance, substance abuse. abuse. Yes. Okay. Because I thought the oversight policy board, and he's also willing to serve as a representative on the um, the main board at the region. I'll give us well, we got three slots, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's one of the three. Yep. Okay. Someone like to make that motion? So moved. That was pretty close. Mm -hmm. I'll second I'm giving, it. I'm going to go Dan. Can you picture that up? <laughs> okay. <laughs> we have a motion and a second into the discussion. Seeing none, I'm in favor of approval of uh, Mr. Canton to the LRE Board of Directors. Indicate by saying aye. 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 Motion carries. And then we have a closed session here. Consider material exempt from public disclosure. There's got to be a roll call vote, but we'll still need someone to make that motion. So moved. Support. Support. All right, Mr. Brown. I'm doing a roll call. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Dannenberg. Yes. Um, Mr. Goldberg. Yes. Ms. Hendricks. Yes. Uh, Mr. Hopler is not here. Ms. Larson? Yes. Mr. Parnon? Yes. Uh, Mr. Savage? Yes. Mr. Serrano? Yes. Ms. Vanderslag? Yes. And Mr. Fenske? Yes. That motion carries. I need a couple minutes to get set up here. Okay. We have, uh, we're back from our closed session and Next item on our agenda is our executive director's report. All right, thank you. Um, I'll give you some updates from the department. I don't actually have a whole lot of uh, news from the uh, House and Senate bills that are out there. Um, we're hearing that not much is going to be done in lame duck, but that doesn't mean that we're completely out of the woods. Um, I, I, um, I have not heard any news in that regard for a couple of weeks. If I get something, I will certainly pass that out to some that in an email. Yeah. Last week, before Thanksgiving, Greg DeYoung and me we met with Roger Victory and Brad Slaw, Luke Merriman, and Bob DeRees. Huh. And they said they didn't think Mary Whiteford's bill are. <coughs> was going to go anywhere. Yeah. After the election, they said they had two weeks packed full of stuff and they canceled the first week. Mm. So they said there ain't going to be enough time. Yeah. Uh, with all the debates and everything. So I, yeah. he thought, they all thought, this is yeah. a done deal. We're going to walk away. 
Yeah, and we're kind of hearing that same thing, although, um, and I'm happy for that in, in a lot of ways, obviously. Uh, however, uh, you know, this was something that certainly they were both pretty passionate about. They were, um, and you know, other years, that lame duck, yeah. they pack a lot in there to get a lot of these bills passed. Yeah. I, I, I don't. I don't understand it why just because the election changed it, but that doesn't change it until after January. So, let's yeah, let, let it change. Yeah, let, yeah. It, let it die. Yeah. Slow and painful death. So, yeah. Um, you know, there will there will be somebody next in line that will kind of take up that torch. Uh, I have no doubt. Yes. It could very well be. There's a uh, gongware. I get a subscription mm -hmm. for gongware. Mm -hmm. And it said this morning on that that uh, uh, they may own this, the house may only meet one day. Yes. Yet yes. this yes. year. Ah, yeah. So oh. can't get a lot done. Never. You know, uh, something like that, Lynn, though, really has to come from within the CMHs, you know, they're the ones that got to come up with a plan if that's the direction they want to do it. And they got to make the, the case yeah. instead of having someone from the outside trying to force something down their throats. Yeah, and we have said all along that um, there are problems with the system that need improving and that we're by all means willing to work on those things. Some of it is um, not entirely our fault or our responsibility. And yet we will, so for instance, you know, one of the biggest problems we have lately is there's truly not enough uh, inpatient beds in the state uh, to, to serve the need. Mm -hmm. And while we're part of that, we don't control how many beds are operated and we certainly don't control admissions for the hospitals. Yeah. So we certainly wanna be part of the solution um, not everything is 100% under our control, but um, by all means, it, I agree with you. I think that um, any significant change to our system would, needs to involve the CMHs and the people we serve and other stakeholders who um, have a lot of important things to say. <laughs> Yep. Yep. 298. Mm -hmm. Yep. 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 I agree. Um, other things from the department, um, we are working on several grant applications, um, children's mobile crisis, again, um, with some changes. And we also um, are working on some other grants for uh, law enforcement or um, jail diversion kinds of efforts. Um, for the Lakeshore Regional Entity, the historic deficit that I've updated you on um, a couple months now. There's really not much of an update other than um, I let you know that the deck action was filed um, on November 2nd. The LRE received the state's response to the LRE motion for summary disposition, as well as the department's cross motion for summary disposition. And the LRE has until December 2nd to um, respond. So I'll keep you informed on that as well. Again, that is that uh, historic deficit um, issue that we, from several years ago, um, several of the CMHs put their own dollars in and would like payment uh, back on that. Um, the LRE is also working to find mediation services um, so that they can continue their dialogue with Network 180. It was suggested that a mediator get involved. 
because there's been some difficulty coming to an understanding um, about moving forward with the operating agreement and the bylaws. Uh, so we're hoping that mediation can help move some of those issues forward. I know Mary and Jim are on the phone. If anybody did have questions about <laughs> anything related to the LRE, uh, they would be happy to answer. Um, so from CMH, I'm gonna remind you for fiscal year 22-23, what our strategic priorities are. Um, so the first one is preserving core services in the public system and the discussion we just had about um, the likelihood that either one of the bills um, does not look like uh, they're going to be successful is a step in the right direction in preserving the public system. Um, we continue to work on integrated health and care coordination. Our CCBHC grant really is um, moving us forward with looking at uh, those types of uh, endeavors. Uh, we're always working on efficiency and accountability, and um, we also really need to focus on supporting our staff and our provider network because without both of those components, we really um, could do what we are doing. So we pay um, close attention to how our providers are doing financially and otherwise. Uh, staffing continues to be an issue um, that we'll you know, continue to work on. Uh, supporting our staff is also something that we really wanna focus on this year. One of the things we're hoping to do is bring in an organization that uh, will train us on um, sort of um, self self awareness, uh, kind of meditation, um, wellness type, types of things, so that um, staff can take care of themselves. Really, because these jobs can be pretty stressful. So, looking forward to that in the new year. Um, we're asking for, uh, we'll be asking for soon a couple new positions, mainly um, funding out of CCBHC, but we also are looking at um, expanding our substance use disorder program. Right now we have a program coordinator monitoring that system along with a lot of other things. And what we hope to do is dedicate a program supervisor. So sort of ahead of the, that department um, so that we can give that area as much, um, you know, attention and uh, dedication as we do our other departments. We're also looking at some case management positions, um, hoping to bring on another nurse practitioner to replace our contract locum tenens and um, also looking at adding um, another fiscal service manager. There's just too much work to be done for um, our current staff. And the, um, really, I think they frequently feel like they're barely keeping their head above water, which is not a good place to operate. So those, I was hoping we would get those through this month, but um, it likely won't happen until, at least for most of the positions, until um, I think we mentioned that uh, the ARPA funds have been uh, decided upon, and one of the um, areas that we received funding uh, to sort of to help kind of spearhead was a million dollars to help recruit and retain psychiatrists to work in Ottawa County. Uh, the thought behind it is that um, we will work with other community providers who do similar work, um, Pine Rest, Holland Hospital, Intercare, um, and try to use these dollars as a recruitment tool to have more psychiatrists come in and work in Ottawa County. Um, sort of a differential between a psychiatrist just seeing adults and a psychiatrist who's board certified to see children, they're even more scarce, but um, there is uh, too long of a wait time to see a psychiatrist right now. We're scheduling out two or three months. Um, most places look at a, you know, anywhere from two to four to even six months to see a psychiatrist. And if, you know, 
what you need is some medication to help with your mental illness. Having to wait that long is just, it should be unacceptable. So um, that, that money um, will, will hold at CMH and um, we'll develop a kind of a steering committee where um, applicants who are interested in receiving this money. So the money would actually go to the organization that employed the person. And it's um, 25,000 a year uh, for four years, up to four years, uh, or 40,000 a year if you're board certified with kids. Once a year for four years. So um, I'll keep you updated on that. I thought that was amazing that um, among the other projects that got uh, funded, um, I think that could actually make a really huge impact if we could get more people to, um, to work here. The other thing um, of particular attention that got funded was um, something that was submitted through four of our local residential providers who were also part of um, that project that we worked with with Grand Rapids Community College to stand up a certificate program for direct service professionals. Uh, that pilot started November 2nd and the money that was requested through ARPA will help to pay tuition for that program. And also um, right now the pilot is um, current staff. So the money will help pay for coverage for those staff while they're gone um, and hopefully be able to pay for some additional tuition in the future. But um, another really awesome project, uh, an answer at least partially to um, our, our huge problem of staffing, um, even though it's a long-term solution, we're trying to get that profession uh, to really be looked at as a career choice and also ha have that come along with a living wage, something that people can stick with instead of it being an entry level job. So that was good news. Um, other things from um, human services got funded as well that I think are gonna help this community. Um, so we were very excited about that. Uh, other than that, I will leave you with, um, you already introduced Dorothy, but happy to have you here. And um, we have a full board right now, even though that will be changing very soon because we'll be losing some of our commissioners, but we'll carry on. Yeah. So. Thank you. Lynn, um, I had um, Thanksgiving morning sat behind a family and one of the girls was home for Thanksgiving, and she works for uh, a bunch of psychiatrists, mm -hmm. a whole group in an office. Okay. She stayed with meetings and stuff like that. And she went to school for in that. I said, hey, do you think you could have any of them would like to live in West Michigan? You know, <laughs> she said, because I said, we're short, you know. Oh, she said, we're terribly short too. Oh, okay, okay, that ain't no. <laughs> then all. So, but I did put a plug in. I said, we got Lake Michigan. You don't have that. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's it's not only our problem; it's a national problem. Uh, part of the reason why we decided to do this project was um, there are some national standards for. Um, some federal assistance for loan reimbursement if you live in a shortage area. Um, and Ottawa is never designated as a shortage area. We tried to change that recent, you know, we tried to give them updated information and we are, um, we're not deemed a shortage area. So Who's the sh who makes that decision? It's based on a couple of different factors. Um, it's based on um, just the number of professionals compared to this, the population. Does that come on like Washington or? Yeah, it's federal data. Uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, it probably is, I can tell you specifically where the report, I, I can give you a link to the report. And it, there's a couple, it's, there's a couple different factors, um, socioeconomic status, um, 
again, number of providers versus population. It just, um, I think in a world, in a country that is short, um, it's who's shorter. <laughs> so. Okay. We don't. I believe they make those appointments the first month, January. Yep. <laughs> Close enough. First yeah. meeting. They won't do it at the organizational meeting. They'll do it at the, at their first official board meeting in January. Our hope is Doug will stay on, certainly. <coughs> well, thanks for your report. Yeah. Yep. Um, other thing is uh, these self-assessment sheets, if you haven't done one, um, turn it in. You can do it online also. And there's finance one to disregard. Yeah, disregard the finance committee. I think it's on which page? First page, um, the very um, last one. Yeah. Because we really don't have that. We don't have a separate committee any no, longer. but I just figured that that was integrated in yeah. the board. Yeah, and you can you could probably still. Yeah, I think right it is. Way. I yeah, I think that it actually does. I. It does say committee, but I was thinking that should be corrected. Yeah, no, yeah, it should. Yeah, so that yeah. So yeah, it would be the board. So you can you can you can you can replace finance committee with board if you want to answer that, and I'll know what you mean. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Assuming Doug expresses his interest mm -hmm. in remaining on the board, is it safe to assume that he would be an automatic appointment by the new commissioners? Or um, just let me address that real quick. I, I have I have talked to at least Jacob Bonama and expressed an interest to be on CMH, but again, that's the board chair's discretion. So hopefully I'm there, but that's not my call. You get rumblings of anything. I want to make sure I'm at that first commissioner's Okay. Board. Yeah, everyone should be there for sure. Will certainly support you. Yeah. All right, thank you. Not happy if they, I mean, you've got one commissioner who's been on and is consistent, willing to serve. They can appoint whoever else they want to. But we okay, understand. well, I appreciate that. And I'll pass that along. The other thing is uh, our next uh, meeting is going to be December 19th. So start, week early. Yeah, it's a week early, but uh, I don't think we want to come. Well, it's a holiday. Right. Yeah. That's right. We'll be here, we'll maybe, but you two won't. Be <laughs> you guys do what you want. Yeah, right? yeah. Yep. Animal. You'll be gone. Yeah, right. So, uh, December 19th, same, same place, <laughs> same time. And now we move to public comment. I, yeah, I, well, I was going to make sure that we. Probably <laughs> asking four, five, seven on Twenty First Street, and I like where we have all of our funding, all of our services providers, and included in this. And we're struggling with the same issue of what's happening in the their needs, a shot of always see that they need as much strong training as the residential people. And I'm feeling over there, big COVID, and we're all lifelong learners, best practices change, and I feel self-directed providers should be included in the training session to be credentialed and recognized for the hard work that they do. And Rosalie, that certificate would be open for anybody, anybody who would want to work in a group home or work with an individual. And There's, then how would people access the program? Well, the, when, when students from high school or wherever start going through this um, program, the certificate program, and again, it's open to anybody who wants to go. Our hope is that <coughs> while they're in that certificate program, we'll be able to do some 
not advertising, but let them know that there are multiple openings at group homes, at individuals' homes. And if they're interested in that kind of work, they can contact us and we'll get them directed to the right people. It's really supposed to be a funnel for anybody who needs help. It's not just for the group homes. They're the ones who submitted the, the ARPA funding, but the, the certificate program is going to hopefully go on much longer than that ARPA funding and um, hopefully statewide. We, what we'd love to do is get the state to help us pay for tuition. So that's my ask when I meet, when, I, when I'm able to get in front of some of the department people. And there was a great presentation. I'm sorry, I was late. I'm sorry, that is right in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. But they made a bus stop. There's no bus stop in front of the police station. And stuff's working on requesting that. But some of the people, they need to go to more service. And transportation should not be barrier to participation. And I'm glad that's what's happening in Holland. So we're trying to so, okay. ask a question. Hey, good oh. input, good points. Yep. So, if, if Rosalie has someone who is working with her and her daughter. This is self-directed. Yeah. If I'm yep. correctly. How does that person then apply to go through this training program? What is their step or process? What do they need to do? They would go through GRCC and there's an online application um, to become involved in one of their programs. No, I, we can. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. It, it's it's so right now it's in a pilot phase and that the, the pilot was specific to people already working in the system. Um, but when it opens up for others, we can certainly <coughs> let people know. My hope is it's a 14 week program and it started November 2nd. So I'm not sure when the next one. And it's here in Holland. They're teaching it here. Yep. Yep. Right. Right. And I know too, it would be making sure that those people going through that pilot program are directed to some of our local jobs that are not filled. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. <coughs> By all means. Sure. Sure. Mm -hmm. Those are good ideas. Training one of the positions that we're requesting, we're hoping we'll be able to do more with our website. It's we, we currently don't have staff that um, Anna can't keep up. <laughs> um, but we, we know how important it is. But, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's it really has to be personalized for us. I mean, we do get help from the county with the website itself and they're pretty uh, quick to respond when we ask to put stuff on. It's just keeping up with what's current and what's new and then putting it on there. It just takes staff time. And at the moment we don't, yeah, we just, it's, it's a part of, we're full up with little pieces of jobs at this point. Get somebody from the outside. So 
we had several things we needed to do on our website. Somebody can come in and do that for us on the bottom. Yeah, Bob, if you want. I I know, but I know I know one or two people in the IT department that do the issue. I'm like, oh yeah. Approach them and see. I I don't you know the key person I would mm -hmm. she retired unfortunately, so mm -hmm. I don't really know the person I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. We. Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Chair. Sure. Oh, there you go. So we already know who the chair is. Okay. We voted. We voted. Now it's not official. I was going to say, yeah, that but, but they already decided amongst themselves who's going to be okay. the chair. Okay. I understand. <laughs> The person should be appointed to the to the mental health board, and then they can volunteer some time to help us with it. Anyway, that's yeah, true. Be careful. That's well, that's okay. Okay. Anything else on public comment online at all? I don't see anybody. All right. Well, if there's no other business. We'll consider ourselves adjourned. Shot.